Good afternoon. Welcome to the 11th episode of the Federal Crowdsourcing Webinar Series uh, brought to you by the Challenge.gov team at GSA. My name is Tammy White and I work on the program under Jara Metter. And today we will be featuring the Federal Crowdsource Mobile Testing Program. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. First of all, I'd like to remind all of you that this meeting is being recorded and will be provided via digital gov following the event. Live captioning is available. If you look to your chat window, you will receive instructions and a link for accessing live, uh, captioning. And lastly, uh, we'll ask you to take a brief survey at the end of the meeting to uh, tell us about your experience today. And with that, I would like to welcome our guest, David Fern. He is an information technology specialist in the Social Security Administration's Office of IT Enterprise Business Support. A longtime advocate for mobile experience, David is a co-leader of the Federal Mobile Gov Community of Practice and the Crowdsource Mobile Testing Program. He works closely with more than 300 volunteers and counterparts across over 30 government agencies and his bi-weekly mobile trends tickers email is a widely distributed resource on all things mobile. I think this community has uh, been around for just uh, over 10 years. And David, we are happy to have you here with us today to tell us about the program and its many accomplishments. Um, so we'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to everybody. I'm really glad to be here this afternoon. For the next few minutes, I'll share with you how the mobile community of practice has used the power of the crowd to test and provide valuable feedback to federal agencies and their mobile sites. So to take a quick look at the agenda here, we'll start with the challenge, and our challenge is mobile testing. The solution, which is using the crowd, we'll see how that we've been able to do that. Talk a little bit about our initial test, and this test really helped and add value during a disaster. We'll then talk about the crowdsourcing process that we're using in order to get these things done. We'll share some lessons learned that we're using and we've learned from the crowdsource testing cycles. Finally, we'll talk about the impacts that we've had on the community, federal government sites, and also federal employees. And then we'll have time for questions and answers, but I want you to know, don't wait until the end to put them in. Be sure to enter, any questions, comments, or thoughts you have along the way in the chat, and we'll get to you them as soon as we can. So let's start off with the challenge. The GSA mobile programs, that's, that's what we're part of, which can be found on the digital.gov site. It was originally stood up by the federal government agencies to meet the 2012 DGS, the Digital Government Strategy. But most specifically, it's to meet to interact with government anytime, so that's day, night, weekend, 24 seven, anywhere, so that's at home, at work, or even on a ball field with your kids, and on any device. And we talk about devices, there's smartphones, tablets, laptops, e-readers, even smart watches out there now. So this is a, a big asking for us. The need for mobile friendliness has been amplified just recently in 2018 with the 21st Century IDEA Act, and that plays directly into the work that we've been doing. We've been working on mobile friendliness, and you've heard about that, that probably in the news. We've evolved our program from just testing apps to see if they're compatible, to looking to see if they're robust enough and to, to deliver the effort and the message that we wanna see, that we receive in our full desktop versions of the applications. So what makes this so challenging? What makes making applications work on all the different devices such a hard task? Well, the answer is compatibility. When we talk about compatibility, a lot of times we don't think that there are many different devices, makes, models out there of mobile phones. For example, you can think about the Apple phones. There's big ones, there's small ones, there's tablets, there's SE, there's 11, 11 Pro, 11 Pro Max. Apple comes up with all these different terms. There's XS, XS Max, and so many others out there. Also Android, 
when you take a look at the Android, there's over 25,000 different Android devices out there on the market. So how are we going to test all these things? Also, you can take a look at the screen size and resolution. There's large, medium, small. There's folding screens out there now, too. Does your application work on all those? Then you combine that with the operating systems and the different versions that are out there. For example, we've got the iOS, we've got Android, there's Blackberries, Windows, all these different operating systems, and each one comes in a variety of different versions. So people can have any different combination out there. And finally, we add on top of that the browser, and that's the main way that we're connecting with these applications. Safari, Chrome, Android, Delphi, Kindle, there's all different out there. So with all these combinations, who has a lab that they can support and fund that has all these different devices out there? Well, nobody. Um, there are a few agencies that are lucky enough to have this, but once you can stock the lab one time, but what about all these new and upcoming devices? Every few months, there's a new device, version, make, and model coming out. How are we going to support all that? The solution? What we've created is the Federal Mobile Crowdsource Compatibility Testing Program. I know it's a mouthful, but this is what we started with a few years back. The philosophy is simple. For feds, by feds. We want to provide a free service to federal agencies to have their app evaluated and tested. And this testing is done by volunteer federal employees, so for feds, by feds. In the framework, we have a crowdsource architecture. And the format that we use is similar to many of the other crowdsourcing applications we've seen out there. You send work out to the crowd to complete. They pick it up, do it. Everybody finishes a small part of the job. They send it back to you, and you combine and compile the results. For example, just in the software industry, there's U-Test, Mob for Hire, Try My UI. So this idea isn't new. It's a tried and true idea and concept that's out there. So why not do it in the federal space? The program's goal has two important pieces to it. Transparency. We want everybody to see what we're doing so that they can duplicate it and they can learn from us. But also we want to share, and you'll see later, as we learn things along the way from our different testing methods, from our different test cycles, we pull out different things that we can share with the community. And this is valuable tidbits of information that they can take back to their agency to make a better website for their agency. So we had the idea and we created a plan. We developed a program and we created processes. We developed process diagrams. We brought out our Visio and we got to work. We created processes for how to recruit testers, how to run the test cycle, how to report issues that we find during the application. And we knew that we were gonna be bringing on temporary volunteer workers. So all these processes needed to be clear and concise so that these people wouldn't have to spend time reading all through a bunch of the documentation, try to figure out how it works. They need to quickly see the process and be able to use it quickly. We created other documentation. For example, there's Mobile Testing 101. We know that most people aren't testers out there, and we, but they're going to be testing the application. So what we've got to do is we've got to set the stage for them, let them know in a nutshell how you test a mobile application. We need to ground everybody in the technology and terminology of testing. This was a crash course in mobile testing that we were able to provide to them. This helped them along the way. It also couldn't be a book. We couldn't say, here, read this book so you can do your hours worth of testing. It had to be concise and small, just what they needed. Finally, we created some uh, templates for test cases and samples. We brought out the Excel and we were able to easily put some templates so that when a different application would come in, what we're going to be able to do is just find steps, find scenarios through the application that we could document in the Excel file. Then maybe most importantly, there's an agency questionnaire. And this will pop up later also. We have probably 10 or so questions in this questionnaire. 
we share it with the agency, and we get the answers back. Now, what this is is the cliff notes for the testers. Once again, we're going to be giving the testers a lot of information out there, but they're jumping into the middle of a process, and they need to quickly be able to read this document and say, ah, the application's goal is to do this, and they want me to check for these things. So I got it. I know what to look for. We also created some welcome agency and welcome tester documentation. These are just some, some email formats and templates so that we could uh, welcome the agency into the fold and welcome the testers in the fold also because we know these people are going to be working as volunteers for us. So we want to be as nice as we can to them, be sure to get them the information that we can and, and bring them in so they can be part of the team. And that's what happened along the way. Finally, we had a, a great artifact repository. So we used Google Drive, and that fits right in with the transparency of the artifacts. So everybody's able to see exactly what artifacts we've created and what we've done throughout the test cycle. So that keeps it sh the sharing information and also transparency. So after creating all these things, you know, we we're still in the process of it, going through some evolutions, and things were starting to really shake, take shape. But then. In May 2013, Oklahoma had a tornado. There were 210 mile an hour winds, $2 billion worth of damage, and 24 people lost their lives. The place was a mess down there. Massachusetts State Senator made a challenge out of a project for the National Day of Civic Hacking. And out of that project came the tornado project, Help for OK. And you can see the little graphic on the right. So it was a mobile application. It was, it was a quick and easy one, but very important. So this mobile application helped three people. First, it helped FEMA. They were able to use this application to find and communicate with people that, that were lost, lost everything that they had. The tornado victims, these victims were able to get on their phone and connect and find out where housing was, where they could get rides, where they could find their pet or where they could store a pet if they had the pet with them. So this was matching people with resources. So very, very important at the time. The fin final part to this is the volunteers. Volunteers were able to use this app to help with the cleanup needs and locations. So they would know what they had to do, where they had to meet people. So this was a really great opportunity for us. It, it just popped out of the blue. So what we did, ready or not, we, we were just thrown into the mix. We didn't know if our processes were ready, but we said, we're ready, good enough, we'll give it a try. So the call went out to testers on our existing list. So we do have a mobile gov list serve, and right now it has about a thousand, it's a thousand member strong. So there's a lot of people that we got on that list, but at the time it was much, much smaller list. So we sent information on the list. We sent them to friends. We sent through word of mouth, trying to get people to volunteer as testers. And it was a quick turnaround. I remember we were working on a Friday and we we're trying to start the, the test cycle on Monday so that we could get this app out to the people. So it was a quick turnaround. But I feel that we were successful as a first attempt. We had 10 testers participated and it was a quick turnaround so that had to eliminate some of the people. But they tested on six unique different devices. So this is important because you remember before when I talked about all these thousands of devices out there and combinations, well, what we've seen with a lot of the, the web applications is that we, can, we don't have to test every single type of device out there. We can group them into smaller groups so we don't have to do everything. So getting these six unique devices was great. And these people that did the testing, they found 40 defects, and that was great. We were able to quickly and easily report the defects to the development team, and they were able to fix the app. So this is great. So we had a great hand and helping with this initial effort out there. Some of the key learnings. So what did we really learn from this? And I think we learned a lot. The biggest thing was there's value in our service because how, how would this emergency app looked out there if the people already lost their house, they lost everything, and they try to click on an app and it doesn't work? Well, that would have been devastating. That would even just added insult to injury. So I think we were able to help them to create a better quality app and put out there that worked and we heard some great things about that app. We also learned that we needed to put some more controls in place. So we had to refine our processes, 
For example, we need to put less reading and more testing. As we said before, the testers come on, they're volunteers. We don't want to just say, okay, here's your 50 page documents you've got to read in order to get this testing done. So we had to pick and choose and we have to uh, reduce the amount of reading that these people need to do to get ready and jump into the process. And that, that was a good learning. We wanted them to focus on the testing. It's more important that they go through that application in different ways and find issues that we can have fixed than just to read a document and become an expert tester. So we in the background managing the test cycle, what we're able to do is we would pick up all the pieces and we would just get emails of issues and that's fine for the first time. We handled the paperwork and all the administration, things were great. Also reporting issues. That's, this is always a challenge. Everybody says, well, this doesn't work. If 30 people submit tickets that say that things don't work and it's the same thing, well, that doesn't add a lot of value. But in this case, what we would do is we would take those duplicates and sort them out in the background. But I think it worked very well. We had a great first effort there with our test case. So from there, we were able to refine our crowdsourcing process. So this is a, a high level view of how we run all of our test cases. While the process remains relatively same, the test steps have evolved. So what we do in these steps has evolved and the tools that we use have evolved to meet the needs of what we're doing. Step number one, we find an agency and an agency with an app. So we talked a little bit about that before. Once we're done with this list, we'll go into each one of these steps in more detail. The second step is to gather some more information on the app and the agency, find out exactly what the, what the point of it is, what they want to try to get out of it. Then we use open opportunities to solicit for testers. We need to find the people that are going to be able to participate in this test cycle. Next, the testers are provided with test cycle information. So we prepare material for them so that they're ready to go and jump right in when the test cycle starts. Then we conduct the test cycle. Now this is the real meat of it. This is usually about a week long and we'll talk about more of that in a minute. And then finally, we compile all the results. We get all these feedback reports. We'll compile them, compile them, share them with the tester, share them with the agency. And then out of there will come some themes that we can use to, to share out in articles with the community. So let's go on into more detail for each one of the steps here. So number one, agencies located. So we need to find a, a new or existing mobile application that's out there. So we can go by a word of mouth. So in our mobile groups or in our listservs, we can hear people talking about new applications that are working on, new things that are coming up. We want to try to get involved in those things. Also, we can see in the news. We'll hear in the news or in federal periodicals, we'll hear, oh, this new app has just been released or somebody's working on an app. That's how we get a lead so that we can try to find an app that we, that we can test and try to help out at our two cents. Then we make initial contact. Usually it'll just be with an email. We'll send it to the people, some owners or project people or somebody that's related to the app will say, hey, how would you like to get some feedback on your site for free? We'll give you that. We'll give some testing. Hey, would you be interested in getting your site, your site tested for free? We can help you out there. So that starts some initial contact. Then we'll have some type of initial meeting. So this will probably just be a, a call. We'll explain the program and some of the expectations. We'll explain what we do, our compatibility testing, how we do it, our, our test cycles. Then we'll describe what we need from them because we can't do this alone. Uh, it is important to know the purpose of the application and why exactly they want it tested, what it's supposed to do. And then finally, what the agency gets. So that's how we can explain to them. We can help to give you some of the answers to give you a better application. We'll then perform an initial test on the application. A lot of times it's um, visual, just a quick list through, or what we're doing now is some static testing. So we run that their site through a couple of tools. What these tools will tell us is how mobile friendly the test is, if it's too big or if, it, if the, the wording and text is too big or too small or it can't be used on certain devices. And what this does is this gives us an initial glimpse into the application for its quality. Because we don't want to just get an application that someone just has given it a whirl with and throws it out there and says, that's good. 
because we'll gather all our testers and we'll spend all our time and everybody will report the same issues because they're easy to find. We want somebody that's a little bit more mature with an application that they think is ready to go so that we can pull out these other finer points and really make that application great. At this point, with all of our information here, we'll determine if the fit and the interest. So this will be our go, no go decision. So at this point, you may say, sorry, you know, your application, we can find some issues here and we'll give you these, but we can do a better job if you can improve it, then we can get down and deeper into the more nitty gritty issues. So next, application information is gathered. So this is where we start to pull together all the information and packets so that we can give to the testers so that they can quickly read through, get up to speed and get the testing done. The goal is to prepare the testers to test quickly. So that's what we wanna do. So we work with the agency to establish the questionnaires. We talked a little bit about that before, sometimes two to three page document. It's just answering questions. So what, what it's supposed to do, why it should do something, a quick read for the testers, the goal, who's supposed to be using it so we can get an idea who, and on what devices, that's also important. And we talk about that a little bit more. Each agency has unique customers and these unique customers come on different devices. For example, at SSA, we've got a field office locator application. You can click on it and it'll find you and give you directions to the closest field office. Well, that's mostly hit with the mobile devices and less on the desktops. So we need to take a look at really the purpose of the application so that we can then target what exactly devices we want and what strategy we want to use to test it. Next to the test scenarios are built. Now we need to get these scenarios from the agency. They need to tell us, look, here are the paths through the, through the application. There may be three or five, some of the most important ones. We initially started doing them, as we said before, in Excel, and that was really easy. We could just put it in, but then we started moving more technical and we created with SurveyMonkey. We were able to do a survey and put the, put the steps in there. And what we would say, what are your results? If did you find something different, then you can just write it right there. We get a consolidated report and that'll help us generate our reports much quicker. But as we, you'll see later, some people don't have access to some of those tools. So we ended up going back with Excel. But whatever tool we use and low tech seemed to work best, we would put the step, the expected result. For example, push this button, you should go to page two. Then they click if it passed or failed, and then if it did fail, they would say the actual results, what happened? And we also encouraged them to submit pictures along the way, because pictures worth a thousand words we know, and that can help us also to, to figure out the issue, just like any testing would do. Then we figure out the device wants and needs. As we've mentioned before, each, each agency has unique customers, customers and devices. And finally, the goals. What exactly does the agency want out of this test, want out of this application? What should it be doing? For example, some would put a new component in and they would say, well, we wanna see how this new component works. Does it work really like the way we want? Or they'd say, some people have been complaining about navigation in our application. I don't know, we wanted to see if people can get through there. Or the graphics, like they've changed graphics or changed fonts, changed things some way. And they say, I wanna see what everybody thinks about that. So these are generally high level open-ended questions, around three of them, and that, that along with the test results will help give the agency exactly what they need. So we work hand in hand with the agency to build these documents. David, you mentioned yeah. um, an initial quick test that you may do. Um, we have yeah. a question on that from the New York City CTO office. Is that initial test open source or is that documented somewhere? That so initial, we, mm -hmm, go ahead. So in the beginning, what we were doing is we would just get the group of us, there would be three or four of us and we would just manually go through and see, yeah, I can go through there. This looks generally okay. And then you'd see if landscape or portrait, but like, like everything else in the community, what we've done is we've evolved. We've evolved to a point where we're able to use tools so, um, for example, the Google mobile friendliness app, and that's one of the really good ones out there because if you point your URL to there, push the mobile friendliness app, it'll tell you right away within just a couple seconds if you're mobile friendly or not. So that's a good, and it's a high level bar. So if, if you meet that, it doesn't mean you're great, 
but you still have other things. And there's all these things that can be improved, but that's the quick and easiest one. In addition to that, we've got uh, eight or 10 other tools and some of those are mentioned in the eight principles of mobile friendliness article that we have. And right now we're working on a, another um, maturity model where we're able to put these tools in there. So that'll be published very soon with different tools and examples. But if somebody wants to send me an email, I can send, or I can send you all the list of the exact tools that we're using. Thanks, David. Yeah, I, I would certainly encourage anyone if you have questions or would like more information about the presentation afterwards, shoot us an email, team at challenge.gov, and then we can work to try and get that information to you. I think a lot of folks are interested in that list of tools that you mentioned, David. Great. And it's, it's not a static list. There are always new tools coming on and coming off, and it's different for your agency. And it's like with any other testing. For example, whenever you go into security testing, you'll test with multiple tools because each tool points to something different, but you can consolidate the results and get some good themes out of them. Okay. Great. So now we have all of our documentation. We've got everything ready. Now it's time to solicit some testers. We need to find some people that are going to do this testing. And the main mechanism is through open opportunities. And if you remember back in episode four, we had Lisa Nelson here and she shared open opportunities with everybody. In case you don't remember, I put the URL here, openopportunities.usajobs.gov. And the purpose of it is to offer professional development opportunities for federal employees that facilitate the collaboration and knowledge sharing across the federal government. And in a nutshell, these are one ads for federal employees. So this is somebody that has a task out there that they'd like a federal employee to do. It's four feds, five feds again. So we create an open opportunity wording posting. We'll see one of those in just a minute, but we create the wording for this test cycle. And then we'll forward the posting uh, information and the posting out on our mailing list. We'll send it to mobile gov listserv. We'll send it to other communities of practice listserv. So it's cross posting. And we'll do it by word of mouth, any of our friends or anybody that we know is interested. And then finally, open opportunities also helps with the advertising. They'll send out and say, here are new, new opportunities coming out. So this is a great place if you want to pick up some little bit extra work and learn something extra. It's great. So as people sign up, and we'll see in a minute the, the graphic, but people will sign up. We welcome and accept the testers. We we'll send them a welcome aboard email so that they know that they're accepted, they know that they're part of the group then. And we give them a few dates and a few things to do so that they're all ready whenever the test cycle comes along. So this is a quick graphic of what the open opportunity solicitation looks like. This is an example that we use for whenever when we tested the Citizen Science Gov app. If you take a look at the top, it has a title, it's help test the mobile compatibility app. Under that, you can see desired skills, so this is pretty much just to, to classify the job, so you know what type of job it is. Even though it says mobile testing or compatibility testing, if you don't have specific experience like that, that's fine. And you'll see later on, that's one of the benefits of the program here. We get people that are project managers, UX people, office people, every type of person you can think of, because everybody can take a look through that app and say, well, I really can't read that and say so you make a comment on it. You say, I couldn't find my way back whenever I got a few pages in. So we need everybody's help. And even though it's asking for a compatibility tester, everybody has the skills to do that. The David, next is the introduction. You, David, sorry. do yes. you also put, sorry for interrupting you. Do you also put something out to the mobile community, the, the mobile community of practice? Are there folks in yeah, so that community that test as well? Yep, once we have the open opportunity here, we send that leak uh, into our listserv for the mobile community of practice. And then we'll cross post into the other communities of practice because you know these are other people that are active. We would try to reach everybody that we can. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Then um, we move down here to what you'll do. So this describes the job. So this talks about compatibility testing and then under that is dates. So as the date of the test cycle, and that's very important because we try to keep the cycle only open for a week. So people have to be sure that they're gonna be available for that week. 
But as, as we alluded to, and as we'll mention later, we say that it should be about an hour for device. And we're happy to take anybody for as many devices as you want to test. But even though we say an hour, it could be two hours of your time because you'll need to get some background information and, and try to get all set up. But then, then you can focus on just that one hour of testing. But if you want to do more, we're glad to have as many as you can do or as many different devices. Right here in the middle, it says the, the person is needed. So we always put just six plus, uh, but a lot of our uh, recent test cycles, we get a, about 30 people testing. So it, it's a great mix, a great combination of people. And some don't make it through. Something comes up, life gets in the way, something comes up, or we try to extend it for them. We do our best to get everybody's thoughts through. But whenever we say we get 20 or 30 people, we really have more than that, because many people are there and they'll test multiple devices. So that's what the important piece is. If one person tests two or three devices, that really helps us out a lot. Then the time, we talked a little bit about the time, about two hours. Location anywhere, you can do it anywhere. You just sit at your desk if you have some spare time at work or from home, any, anywhere you wanna do it. Then on the right-hand side, you'll notice all these people that have signed up. So these people, this is a good example, they signed up. The green button on the top will open up and it says a signing. So I'll click on them. And they'll send them an automatic email. I'll send my email to them. We'll start the test cycle. The test cycle will be complete. Once it's complete, I, collect, I click on task complete. And what that does is that marks it complete, shows that they've done the task, and it gives them credit, and it also gives them a badge in, in open opportunities. So that's our thank you to them for completing this task. So it's all just like the help wanted ads that you can see trying to hire somebody. This is getting a part-time person to work a part-time gig for us. On to step four, testers are provided the test cycle information. So we're getting ready for the test cycle now. We've created all the information for them. When we found what testers are gonna use, so now what we've gotta do is we've gotta send them out an informational mail. We've gotta provide them details and reminders of ma reminder mails throughout the test cycle. And what we found is communication is key because we know these people are only with us for a little while. Everything's new to them. We do have many repeat people, but there are many people that are new and there for the first time. And we don't want them to have to hunt and peck and try to find things. So key, clear communication is what's going to get them through quickly and have them have a great experience and come back with us. So the dates we mentioned are usually a week and start about any, any day of the week, last about a week. And the process, um, we'll tell them resources that are available. There's plenty to point to, some of the ones that we've created, but also we point to some online resources. Some people wanna read and they have time so they can read up on mobile testing or they wanna find out how something else works. So we're glad to present that to them. The application URL, they can always look at that application URL ahead of time, uh, unless the application is brand new or it hasn't, it's being rebuilt or up and down. And reporting issues. So this is probably the key. This is what we really want to get out of this. We want them to have an easy way that whenever they find an issue, they can report it. So we've got to have these steps ready for them using a clear tool and clear steps so we don't lose anything in the process. That's the worst thing. If we somebody thinks they found something, but they don't report it, and then we've lost that opportunity to find it, it makes the application even better. We said before the test cycle is about an hour. That's, that's what we tell them and that's what we try to promise them. But as we'll see later, if they uh, opt to attend uh, a meeting up front or if they wanna spend more time prepping, it could be two hours for a device. And we don't really time them and some people have spent even, even more time, but that we're happy to take whatever they can give us. So right before the meeting, we'll generally have a test cycle kickoff meeting to set expectations. And this is an optional meeting because we know everybody's busy. We know everybody's time is very busy, uh, very um, short. So what we do is this is a 30 minute briefing and this is just to build communication. So this is for the extra people or the new people. We really recommend you come there. Then they have the free communication over the phone to talk. We have some of the veterans usually show up and they say, oh, well, here's how I did it and they help them out. But this helps to build the community and this helps them feel at ease whenever the the actual testing started. And that's very, very important because we want these people to be able to share the information 
as easy as possible and don't feel intimidated. And that's the way they can kind of put a, a voice um, instead of just an email coming from someone directing what to do. David, David, a couple questions for you. Um, when you are trying to, you know, gather your crowd for a particular, uh, you know, to test a particular um, experience, how many people are you looking for at a minimum? I know that you'll, you'll take as many as you can get, but is there a number that you're generally looking for or is it more of how many people to cover um, the different browsers, the different applications and so forth? What, what, do, you, what do you typically look for um, when it comes to the size of your crowd that's participating? So what we were normally getting was about 20 to 30, and that's great mm -hmm. because then we get a big mix and combination of devices and makes and model. And I think that's probably optimal because once you start getting more, start getting tough to wade, wade through everything and, and mm -hmm. it's just a mass of people. But if it's a test that has some specific requirements, for example, we were testing some native applications. When it's a native application, those are a little bit more challenging because you've got to be able to install your application on Android, which isn't too bad. But if you have to install an application on iOS, um, you can only support so many people on there because it has to connect in with the, the server, with the, um, the Mac system. And they only have so many different um, licenses for how many people that can connect in to give it a test and to get through firewalls. It's also so, like, for example, those tests had fewer people, maybe five people for each one, Android and an iOS. So it really depends what it is. And if we're specifically looking for somebody with a tablet or some other device, it may be a smaller group. But in general, we try to get as many as we can, just open to all combinations of devices and makes and models. Thanks. And I'm just wondering, have you seen an uptick or change in um, the number of requests that you're receiving from agencies or um, the, the, the size of the crowds kind of coming to these different um, testing cycles with 21st Century Integrated Digital Experience Act? Have you seen any changes at all? So I think we've probably done fewer test cycles in this, in this method but we have done many more, like I explained, with the tools and the static method, because we're able to, when someone says that they need something done, we can quickly and easily generate a bunch of information for them, consolidate a result, and give them those results, and that's a great head start for them to start fixing things. Okay, thanks, David. Sure. Okay, on to step five. Finally, time to test. So we've got all our testers in place. They've got all the information. We say, okay, start testing. So the testers will review the documents. So as we said, we don't want this to be hours worth of reading. They'll complete the scenarios reporting any issues. So for example, as we've mentioned before, they'll, it'll say a step. So step, go to this URL, press this button, and you should see this. That's the expected result. They'll put pass or fail. And if they didn't see what they're expecting, they put the actual result and then they'll, they'll write log some defect in one of our mechanisms. So once they've gone through the scenarios, that's great because now they've got a few paths through the application, so they're pretty familiar with what the application looks like. So now what they're able to do is do some guerrilla testing. What that is is you just beat up the application or try to use it just like a, a regular customer would use it. So you can think what customers would do when they use it. Or you can just try to switch around, go back and forth between the screens every, everywhere just to see where you end up and see if you can find your way back out. See if you can read all the screens. Then they'll respond, they'll think, okay, I finished my testing now. So I've got my th round three open-ended questions. So that maybe was that component good and you can think, and they're open-ended questions, they'll write their comments there and then they'll submit their results. We said, was SurveyMonkey, then e email and Excel, we've switched things back and forth to accommodate the teams. So this is where we really got our, our great feedback. Then step number six, time to compile the results. So we can collect and compile all the results, including everybody's comments with their 
uh, initials. So it's very, very important that we include their initials because when we create that report, um, we'll have each of the steps there and we'll have the comment that each tester made along the way. I just put their initials instead of the whole name just to shorten things. But this is very good because they're able to see, look, I reported something and they've really taken my comment seriously and they've included in there. And what we're able to do from that is we say, look, 10 people said, look, this is a problem. So that's a key theme there. If only one person did it, we've got to investigate a little bit deeper. But if, if 10 people say, hey, I couldn't read this writing on this page or it runs over the page, you can know that that's a challenge. And so that helps goes into our, our key themes whenever we, we tell the agency of things that they can fix. We share the report with the testers to get their comments so they, they have a last chance to say, well, I didn't really mean that or I thought of something else. And that's, that's what happens. And, and even sometimes, since this is a manual process, I've heard someone say, hey, I had a comment on that one. You didn't include it. Say, well, give it to me again and we'll put it in. So that's, that's their way to know that they've contributed. Then we'll share the results with the agency. So this is great. This is a great time for them to hear. And a lot of times they'll say, well, yeah, I was expecting that. That's what we were thinking. That's why we asked for your service. And we gather our main themes um, for community articles and for sharing. So if, if we say, look, uh, and we'll see this in a few minutes out of some of the findings, but whenever we see something like a carousel that didn't work, we can say, hey, this is a good one that everybody should know about. So then we'll write an article on that so we can share it out with the community. So as we share the results with the testers, sometimes we'll have a debriefing meeting. And this is really great because the agency can be in the meeting and the testers can be there. And usually the agency has, has great things to say. And they'll say, you know, thanks for your help. This is really going to be contribute to our next version of our application. And I think that's great for the testers to hear. They all don't have time to come or show up, but it's great for them to hear. Or even in a mail, sometimes the agency will just send the mail and say, thanks for your great work. Because they can see that they've really had a hand in improving a mobile application for some federal site. So lessons learned. I think we've learned a lot. We've talked about some of them along the way and I've broken this down to people, process, and technology. So let me just start with the people. And people are eager to help. The people that sign up on here, even though they're volunteers, they really want to give it their all and they spend a lot of time helping us out. But as I mentioned before, communication is key. We have to tell them exactly what we want and what we expect, and they'll give it to us with no problem. We just have to ask the right questions and provide the right instructions so they can get through. And, and they give us great feedback that, that wouldn't be gathered otherwise. They give great feedback from diverse perspectives. Like I said, there's UX people, project managers, developers, testers, there's office people, and everybody is coming at it from a little bit different perspective. And you can tell how the way that they come from a different perspective by the comments that they're writing. But this is great because that's, that's the whole purpose here. And all these applications are going out to all the public and the public is a huge mix of people also. So this is great. And they have a, a great diversity in the technical skills. So there are some developers and we'll see in a minute when we're using tools like GitHub, the ones that were developers, well, I use that every day and that's easy. But if, you, if you're not a developer, well, you've never used that tool and it's really not intuitive. So we can see these different skill levels and we've got to try to target it so that we can get the best out of them. And as I mentioned before, there are some testers that have been there every single test and they're always there and ready to go. Other ones take a test and, and they go, either they don't have time or they're not interested. But we try to give the best experience to everybody and hope that everybody learns something along the way. Process, move on to lessons learned for process. In the test cases, some said they were time consuming and link checking took too long. So this, this was an issue that we had in the beginning. What we told people is, okay, we, we were very detailed in our step. Check this, check this, check, check all the links on the page. Well, someone had an application that had 50 links on a page. So they spent, they spent an hour checking links and we probably should have been more clear and checked ahead of times because they didn't have to do that. But they did, nobody was upset, but we learned that for the future. And, and so we were able to enhance our documents. Some people recommended that we split pages and um, split up pages for testing. So they said, well, there's 50 pages in this application. I don't think I can get through the whole thing. So for some of the bigger applications, we tried to focus some people in different areas and that worked somewhat. But what we ended up doing is going back again and just 
decreasing the level of testing so that they could get to all the pages and someone could see the whole view, the whole holistic view of the application instead of just some small part. Documentation. So we revamped our documentation uh, about, and we reorganized it. You know, initially we had probably six documents, big documents, and we tried to consolidate them into fewer documents so they weren't all over the place and, and everybody could really find out what they are. Um, more Testing 101, so we enhanced our Testing 101 documents. We put some more links. If, if people are interested in finding out more, there's plenty of links from the read, but if they just wanted the high level, they were able to read what we had. And test preparation. Some people said, well, this is my first time testing. They felt really anxious. So they said, I, I want to test, I want to practice site so I can start testing on and follow the instructions. So what we did is we were able to share some of the old test cases with some of the other sites. So they could just follow that through just like they would be doing in the regular application or testing. So that's available to them too. So we just have to understand that we've got people coming in at all different levels. They all want to do a great job. So we've got to give them the tools to do it. The next is a survey. We were giving a survey each time. They said it was a bit long. We're, you know, we're always trying to get all the information we can, but we shortened that up, reduced the amount of questions, and made them more concise and pointed. And testing took longer than expected for, for some people. So we scaled back the testing and we more refined them in areas. For example, we talked about the people that put a new component in. Well, we could focus more around that little component instead of just spreading out through the, the whole application. So communication is key, and we've been able to streamline our processes, and we need to make them short and sweet to get everybody up and testing. And technology. So these are probably the biggest learnings and biggest challenges. They, and we think that they're not, but, that, but they always seem to be. So some of these, like uh, GitHub that we talked about, so that's a new tool to many, unless they're in the software development field. So the whole goal of that was to use it as a repository for the defects, and that's fine. That's what many development agencies do on or they do, or they store code there. And so for them, it's, it's everyday life. It's what they do. But some people <laughs> were trying to read directions for it, and it, it, they just didn't get it. And usability is not great on that. I, I must admit that. And in there, it, the people were having trouble searching for issues. So what we've done is we, we discontinued that. And we send defects now in Excel sheets or emailing the old, the old fashioned tech way. And that's, uh, if people are interested in using GitHub, we can use it for them. But generally the people were happier just putting it in, in Excel, make it quick, easy, send it on. Just using Google Docs seemed, seemed to be a challenge for some. It was new to some people haven't used it before. They were worried if I update this document, is it going to erase everybody else's things or not? So we, we just mainly use that for um, management of the test cycles in the background now. And then we do all the, the tough paper pushing work in the background and do that. Then agencies have different um, access to tools. For example, someplace, even where I am at SSA, we're not allowed to use Google Docs, so we can't get that. So the people, some people could try it and they could do it at home. So then what we ended up doing is just saving we would send them a link, so if you want to enter stuff directly, you can, or then we'd send them a regular file so they have the information anyway, and people would choose whatever is quick and easiest for them. Some agencies have file size problems, so we'd send them these five attachments and they would never get it. I guess the attachments would be stripped out, the mailboxes are small. Then finally, we talked a little about SurveyMonkey. Looks like it's a great survey and it, it does great because all the information is right there. But for each one of the steps, some people didn't have access to SurveyMonkey, and so we went back to the Excel, and we may go back to it again. We'll, we'll see what happens. But the goal is fast and easy for testers. Focus on testing, not learning a tool. That's what we had to find out there. And low tech is what always seemed to, to be the, the rule to make things work better. So the final technology one, and this is really what we were looking for. This is part of the part of the program. So what did we find out? We found out that carousel behavior on mobile devices was inconsistent on some applications. This, the carousel is whenever you look at some of these big applications, you can click and flick through a bunch of, bunch of pictures on it and it goes round and round. Well, we found that almost some of the Android devices for one application, well, they weren't going side to side, they went up and down whenever you turn it to um, landscape. So different behaviors, but we reported that. We've got articles on that. 
some applications don't use or some devices don't use flash. We know that the Apple stuff doesn't use flash. And that was found in a test cycle. Displaying data and charts. Everything looks great when you're sitting at your desk and you've got two or three screens up and you've got a big chart with lots of data. But whenever you compress it down to your little cell phone, you can't find where you are on the chart. The amount of information, everybody wants to put everything on their, on their site, but that causes people not to know where they are or really find stuff. And the size of the components also. Sometimes that gets in, in the way. And then pathing through the applications. People get lost in the applications. And if you build it, you know where everything is. But when you go out to a public using it for the first time, they, they don't know. So we've created articles on, on these things, and these also come up as great discussions in some of our mobile meetings. So we can talk about these things. This is a, a don't let this happen to you thing. So we move into the final part here. We've got the impacts. So the crowdsourcing program provided federal employees a mechanism so that they can stay involved in testing, learn about testing, get some hands-on practice in testing, they can learn and share what they do learn about the testing and the apps that they do, and they can take that information back to their agency. And they can share information um, by participating in the cycles. They can read and write articles. We always participate people, or we always ask people to do that. We've got our digital.gov site out there, and you can connect into some of our great articles. We publish a mobile trends ticker every two weeks. That's what's new in mobile, the articles that have come by. And we've got the Federal Mobile Testing User Group. You can get on that listserv and get some more information. So this was a win-win-win. The tester gained mobile knowledge so that they could take it back to their agency. The agency received great feedback, actionable fee feedback that they can use to fix their site. And the mobile, uh, the mobile community has found challenges that we're able to publish to try to prevent others from having the same issues. So far, we've had 26 agencies that have had applications tested. That's, and here are just a, a few of them. And we've had over 300 federal employees that have participated from over 30 agencies. So I think we've, we've gotten a lot of people involved in this community and doing these tests. And this is great because we want to try to help anybody out anywhere they have mobile devices. And as, as we know now, mobile devices and people are hitting your, your sites with about 52% of them are coming in on mobile devices. So we're really over the 50% mark. So mobile really has to be taken into consideration at all the agencies. So I encourage you to join the Federal Mobile Gov Community of Practice. I put the link here. It's where you can learn about mobile applications, devices. Uh, we use these things every day, but we can always learn more about how they work and share your knowledge and help other agencies improve their mobile applications. So with that, we've reached the end and I'd like to open up for any questions, comments, or thoughts. You can put them in the chat. Thanks, David. Uh, I know that folks are really interested in the list of uh, tools that you mentioned that you use. I know that um, at least one participant has asked if you can share uh, where the articles relating to lessons learned are posted. And again, I would remind folks that if you would like more information on the presentation or if we can provide it to you, you can email the team at challenge.gov box and we would be happy to um, provide you with additional information. So just let us know how we can help. Um, David, it occurs to me when you were talking about the documentation that you provide for the crowd to help them get started, um, that might not be unlike what we see in citizen science. You know, a lot of folks who may not necessarily be uh, experts in a particular field, but they find something that's interesting in their community or um, a project that they've always been curious about and they uh, look for information on how to get started. So there's a, a certain amount of documentation that they might need to read through to see um, what would be required of them. but. Not a scary amount. It doesn't sound like that's the case for the mobile crowdsource um, testers either. Is that true? Yeah, I think we have to create a test case so they can follow the test case and know what's expected of them to look for. And there's plenty of testing books out there, but you don't need to be a mobile testing expert to be able to get some of this testing done. And when we're talking about compatibility testing, what we'll ask them to do is, Open up the application, you go through the different pages and see if you can 
touch the application, see if you can touch the touch points, see if you can read it properly, see if you can fill in the blanks. Then some of the tricks are, well, you turn it landscape, now try to do it. See if you can go through all the same things. So there's a few different key, key things like that. We say, do this and try a landscape, try a portrait. And then we say, you know, try to skip to another page. See if you can find your way back out. So it's, right. it's probably a little bit easier than some of the science things. I think it's, it, it's almost like a checklist, would you say, in a way? Yeah, we try to, to create extent. it like a checklist or things to keep in the back of your mind whenever you go through. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Great. That's really helpful. Um, we are about five minutes away from the end of the webinar, and I wanted to make sure that we're opening the floor up to anyone who would like to ask a question um, of David Fern on the Federal Crowdsource Mobile Testing Program. Um, please pop your question into the chat. I'm going to remind folks that um, this is being recorded and we will make this video available on our Digital Gov event page and also on YouTube. Um, so please feel free to share with your colleagues if they've missed it. Um, so I was looking at the open opportunities page that you created and you also um, you know share uh, a new um, testing cycle with the mobile community of practice are there other ways that you sort of advertise or promote um, new uh, testing cycles that are coming up so we, we try to keep everything within open opportunities because that'll be our way to mainly track the people but once we create that page, we can send that link to the community of the practice, to cross post to the other community of practice, just send it by email to groups of people so we can try to get everybody involved. Okay. But they do All sign right, into that one site. The, the challenge is they do have to have the, the uh, US Gov password. <laughs> right, right. But contractors can participate too. Is it possible for contractors to participate or just federal employees? Yeah, unfortunately, all of our listservs and all of the testing cycles, everything is for .gov and .mil only. Email addresses, got it. Okay, yeah. here's one quick question. Um, are there any subgroups like agency specific for sites that might be internal for an agency? And Heather, you might need to provide a little bit more information on that question, but are you thinking about um, crowdsourcing subgroups? And while we're waiting for Heather to clarify, uh, yes, that's what she says. Yes, she's interested in whether or not there are any crowdsourcing subgroups, like agency-specific subgroups for sites that might be internal for an agency. Yeah, I haven't heard of any out there. Um, but so the interesting thing is, for example, at SSA, we have a, a, a place similar to the, the open opportunities where you can apply if you need somebody to help with you in the agency. You can, uh, you can put that little job posting out. So I imagine you could do the same thing within your agency if you have that kind of mechanism. Thanks, David. Hopefully that helps, Heather. Uh, but we'd be happy to follow up with you separately too. Um, question from Ariel. Was there analysis of responsive websites or progressive web apps? Is that handled so, by the program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what we've done is we try to do responsive only. Well, we try to do responsive only. We have done a few native and we haven't found any of the progressive web apps, but if they have one of those, that will be a good, interesting one to test. And we know there are some out there. All right, Ariel, you might have to throw some David's way. <laughs> and with that, I think we're just about at time. David, I certainly wanna thank you for joining us today to share um, the Federal Crowdsource Mobile Testing Program and how you are mobilizing a federal crowd um, to help agencies improve their mobile experience. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for the opportunity. Sure, and folks, please don't forget you'll be receiving a survey. Please take a couple of minutes to complete it. Tell us uh, what more you'd like to see from us and what we can do better. Uh, to continue to bring these um, informational sessions to you. All right, so thanks everyone. Have a great Tuesday.